Robert, welcome to the show. How are you? Uh, welcome, uh, Pietro. And um, uh, it's an honor, a big honor, really, to, to be with you, with both of you. Uh, it's wonderful, really, to join you. And uh, two men that are promoting so much uh, the independent guys. Yeah, it's uh, really a pleasure. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Excellent. It's fantastic to, uh, to welcome you on board. And uh, uh, we have been aware of uh, what you've been doing for the last uh, four or five years, I think. 2017, yeah. yeah. And um, so it was, uh, it, it's fantastic to see uh, your brand uh, evolving, developing, growing, and even looking at what you have in front of you there now, which I think is the table waltz. You know, yes. to, uh, <laughs> it's beautiful. Our new baby. Absolutely beautiful. And uh, Thank you so much. yeah. We 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 are looking at, at uh, moving in that direction ourselves, Pietro, with uh, in, in the clocks, yeah, and uh, so it's it's fantastic to see some of our uh, watchmaking friends because they're two very different, uh, totally different markets. And uh, everyone skills. told me, uh, everyone told me at the beginning when I uh, launched the table clock now that I must be completely uh, crazy that no one will buy it. Uh, and uh, actually, we we already shipping. Uh, we shipped already the first pieces to collectors in Austria, in Switzerland, uh, the heart of watchmaking, let's say, to Switzerland. This one is going to Switzerland actually, and uh, and even to Japan. So it's uh, for us. It was a very important project. Uh, uh, we are super small, super niche, and uh, it's also about, uh, of course, our Austrian heritage. You no, know? uh, if uh, if we could uh, turn around uh, here. <laughs> The, the, the screen just for a second uh, you're gonna see like from 1850 around 1850 uh, a, uh, a table clock uh, from from the Biederreier yeah? and uh, so basically uh, it's really about um, our aim to, to, to yeah to, to keep on uh, moving the flame and not the ashes in that sense uh, this table clock was meant to be a table clock for the 20, 21st century and um, I think uh, it it really helps us to to build the brand. Yeah, excellent. The, the effort to uh, build uh, rebuild Carl Sushi as a name in watchmaking uh, goes through obviously utilizing the assets that you have around you, Robert. One is your uh, incredible artistic background. Uh, the other one is obviously the legacy of uh, Austro-Hungarian uh, uh, watchmaking of the past, and the third one is obviously the uh, platforms that are available with uh, within Switzerland, you know, uh, to uh, to recreate a name that has to be to a certain standards from the beginning. It cannot be, uh, it cannot be just any, you know, any kind of maker uh, behind. So, where is Carl Sushi today in that respect? Do you see it as a hybrid proposal? And the world's clock is now your way to say, okay, now the Vienna. The Vienna background is going to become predominant and we're going to move watchmaking more and more into, into Austria. Where do you stand? Where is the brand standing at the moment? Uh, well, uh, first of all, um, with the amazing heritage we have and also, I mean, I got here like a, a little photo of uh, uh, the old uh, Suki, the founder, who was invited uh, to the uh, wedding ceremony of uh, Emperor Franz Joseph and, and Sisi. Uh, you know, to to build on that, uh, I I really um, said I have to be at the same level when I restart uh, as the old Suhi was, and he was the purveyor to the Habsburg court, and he was uh, the most important watch uh, master of uh, of his age. And so, th therefore, I was when I started out, I was looking uh, for the best uh, watchmaker, watchmaster, uh, for the best uh, movement maker, for the best uh, designer, young designer. That's certainly one asset, uh, as you mentioned, being used to work uh, with cutting edge creatives uh, from the art world. And then uh, with uh, Mark Yeni and uh, Voshi and uh, uh, many other people that uh, helped me out, uh, not coming from the watch uh, industry, uh, actually it was uh, really a challenge. But then again, it uh, can be traced back to our history because uh, at 1822, we were born in uh, Prague. We are celebrating this year 200 years. We then, uh, of course, everyone wanted to be in Vienna. So also Karl Suchi wanted to be in Vienna. That was uh, the, 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 the most prestigious uh, thing to be purveyor to, to, to the court. And then uh, in 1852, there was already uh, by 
the son of uh, Suhi, the founder, a, 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 a pocket watch uh, uh, manufacturer in La Chaux de where today still yeah. we have all the, the great brands. And in that sense, uh, I think we want to continue to bridge uh, this kind of uh, Swiss Austrian uh, legacy, which has always has always been there, basically. Exactly, and also yeah. uh, reaching out. Uh, last year we were present at uh, in Prague. Uh, we would love to uh, collaborate uh, with uh, people also from from uh, Czechia. So really to to build on uh, that uh, wonderful base we have, but not you know, repeating the past, but really uh, doing something uh, worth for the 21st century, for now. And uh, we just had a, a client here for the table uh, clock. Uh, she saw the historic watch and the historic clock, but also uh, the contemporary one. And, you know, she wants the contemporary one because we are living now and, and here. And in that sense, I think we're going to uh, continue. We are, for example, on Thursday, we have uh, a meeting at, uh, with uh, Mark Jenny, with uh, Sven from Boshi, where we are discussing uh, next uh, lines of uh, ex uh, extending our collection. We are working, for example, for this year still to release a uh, sports, uh, elegant sports watch called Belvedere, because Belvedere is just the castle across our private showroom here, the famous Baroque uh, castle, an amazing piece of art. And which is our inspiration again, no? because we say, okay, we are not claiming that we can drive very fast. We, can, we don't claim that we can dive very deep. We don't claim that we can fly very high. No, we claim that we can go for a meditative walk in the, in the Baroque gardens of the Belvedere Palace uh, of uh, Prince Eugene. And so in is that sense- new line, uh, Is this new line gonna have an integrated uh, steel bracelet? Big question. That not uh, like not in the first version. Not in the first version. No, we are not jumping okay. board what's uh, hot right now. Uh, it's uh, no. Um, I don't do uh, green tiles either. Uh, yeah. No, <laughs> because it's, because it's always, uh, we always look, uh, for example, uh, there's a proposal for a Dubillon, uh, and I don't do at this moment a Dubillon because I have not found a take uh, on what is the Suki way uh, of a Dubillon. No? The same was. Uh, valid for the table clock also for, for the whites number one. No? So it really has to make sense with our DNA, with our legacy and our spirit of creativity and innovation uh, with uh, the waltzing uh, second, for example. No? Uh, it, it was a yeah. first. And in that sense, uh, I, I push, uh, I try to push the limits. And perhaps it's also in that sense, you mentioned my background in the arts as a curator, and that uh, was through the arts that I discovered this uh, wonderful historic uh, brand that uh, at the beginning I was sort of feeling ashamed. You know, there are so many great watch experts in, in the world and I really respect them a lot. And I was ashamed to mention that I'm not coming from the watch industry. But uh, sometimes uh, it was, I think, in the process, um, a, an advantage because it was a certain naivety perhaps on the one hand, but on the other hand, I can question things, you know, why, why don't we do that that way, you know? Uh, yeah, and also- You've taken a when you set the bar to decide how to reinterpret Kao Suhi, now I understand is the way of pronouncing, uh, I was saying Sushi is Karl Suhi. Um, you, took, you took, obviously, you, did, you dug into your artistic background, choosing an architect like Alfred Laws, that was very, very groundbreaking in his days uh, for the use of minimalistic uh, lines and shapes, which was yeah fairly disruptive to what was happening in those days from the architectural point of view. I'm not an expert, but I think Alfred yeah, Ross yeah. is one of those names that- uh, The emperor hated him. The emperor hated him. You see, you see. So that, that, do you think, do you feel that uh, now Alfred Laws would, uh, would particularly enjoy and, uh, and, and agree with the way uh, you, are, you are showcasing his, uh, his art and his uh, inspiration? Uh, I think so, because, uh, you know, uh, if you look at the watch, there are some um, we, we really deeply respect uh, and, and coming from also the design scene. Uh, there are some features that are only laws really define. For example, when you look at the Vals number one, there are very seamless connections from one material to the next, you know, like uh, the leather to the, to the steel, you know, uh, the lugs that are integrated. Um, the dial that is bent up uh, to connect with uh, basically the, the glass. So uh, there's um, many, many little details that uh, inform you about uh, this, uh, this kind of legacy. 
Exactly, yeah. And, uh, and I think uh, what we try to do is, again, not, not just uh, uh, copying, but really making an elegant wristwatch, but that at the same time is very contemporary. Uh, it's basically also, uh, I think, uh, the way to move forward. Uh, you cannot just, many people at the beginning ask me, yeah, uh, why, don't you, why don't you do more conservative pieces or, or more eclectic pieces? But uh, I think um, I'm, I'm doing watches for people in the know. That's at least my aim. Yeah, exactly. there is a, there is a D DNA, there is a line that you need to keep, especially on, on revamping uh, a name that has not been there for, for a long time. So That's there is exactly. an interesting observation as well from uh, Watches in Words, our, our regular friend. Thank you for, uh, for your intervention. Very happy to see more table clocks. This is a great move into the right direction. We all should use clocks to adjust our watches. And what you did, what you did uh, counterintuitively, Robert, you used a, a table clock, which is by any means a classic uh, device, but completely reinterpreted in, uh, in the fashion of Karl Suchi of today. So with a, with a contemporary design and a very avant-garde materials as well that you've used. Yeah, it's a really uh, high-end handcrafted. And again, you know, it's... Uh... Um, for example, a, a collaboration uh, with uh, other uh, wonderful uh, craftsmen uh, from Lobmeyer, for example, with the glass, which is uh, hand cut, it's hand reviewed. Uh, it's um, a brass, solid brass block that we are cutting out this uh, uh, wonderful shape. It's, uh, it's very heavy, <laughs> actually. And, oh, yeah. and, and then again, uh, two years of development of, uh, of our movement. Uh, which again, you know, uh, takes a little bit uh, from our uh, skeleton uh, wrist uh, wrist watches. No? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. it's um, it's everything. Ho hopefully, uh, there's a, it's like a sync. No, it's uh, synchronized and it's uh, it's one language. Uh, hopefully, yeah. Definitely, I can see that uh, design language uh, uh, transferring directly across the the wheels. The the, the the parallel or the offset cuts into into the wheels etc. They're very like the dial of of, uh, of the, the watches uh, themselves. It's a it's a beautiful thing. And uh, I actually just did, as you were talking there, I was thinking about how uh, your watches. You were talking about integrated bracelets. Here. Yeah, it's an absolutely beautiful. Isn't it, Pietro? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. I love the idea of. Uh of um, marking the moment with such a, an object that is, is reminiscent to the past, but is, sorry, reminiscent of the past, but is also uh, completely re-elaborated in a different, completely different uh, style Language. to what you would expect yeah, from a classic yeah. brand. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, thank uh, you so much. Johnny, you, you were saying, Johnny. How, um, so whatever you're saying, you're, you're not, you're, you're, the, the Belvedere is not per se a diver's watch or an aviator's watch or, uh, uh, motor racing inspired, but more by the the leisurely sporting activities that most most people enjoy, which is a, a walk around a beautiful park. And uh, you don't really, it, Carl uh, Suki doesn't really follow with convention anyway. So it, it, you're not really following what the latest trends are. You're establishing a, a very classic style that is influenced clearly by Austrian heritage and historic, uh, the arts, the architecture, the all of the things that surround you in your, mm -hmm. your life. That's how I see so, uh, Carl Schicke and, um, as I say, not being uh, uh, a, a, a hip brand and all that, that you, you're look, looking for a, a particular, uh, to a, a young audience, but you're looking for a lot more sophisticated, reserved, informed, collector who is uh, probably like yourself, Robert, has uh, an in interest in the arts and the, yeah. the, 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 the finer, the, 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 uh, the nuances of detail. Exactly. Uh, no, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Uh, that really appreciate this kind of uh, love and dedication we put into creating uh, our watches. Yeah. It's not, uh, it's, it's, really, it's, it's, uh, it's really a passion project, I can tell you. Sure. It, it leads to another question, really. You say it's a passion uh, project. What, what 
made you gravitate towards uh, Carl Sagan, re reviving a brand that has been dormant for 100 years, yeah. approximately. And uh, to to go back into it again with, uh, with I have to say, one of my favourite people in watchmaking is uh, Mark Kinney. Uh, one of the first independents that I really befriended whenever he was uh, with AHCI. And um, I got to know him very early on and uh, uh, love for it. I, I, I actually sent him a message earlier today before I even knew that we would be talking later on today. So, oh, great. Uh, I see him on uh, Thursday. I'm going to see him. You tell Let's him. You tell him. Johnny said, get in touch. Okay, Johnny, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, my, my my question to you was sir, about uh, that that uh, move that uh, yeah. drift from uh, from your uh, art creation into uh, the watch industry. What was the? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it was not like a very strategic move. Basically, what I did was uh, I was preparing a uh, a design exhibition as a curator for the Triennale Museum in Milano about Austrian design. And by researching uh, not just the contemporary cutting edge design of today, but uh, historic uh, pieces from 1900, etc., I, I came across uh, this brand and I thought, my God, uh, such a wonderful story. Uh, Sigmund Freud, uh, this, the inventor of psychoanalysis as a, as a client uh, in three countries, uh, etc., present. Um, and as I said, uh, you know, uh, what, me was, what really drives me is making something beautiful out of nothing. You know, it might be exhibition, it might be an artificial island on the river, which I did, uh, it might be a watch. And in that sense, when I came back from that exhibition, I said, um, I'm turning 50, uh, I want to do this, uh, I want to recreate uh, this uh, and restart uh, this amazing uh, legacy brand. And I did a first, uh, um, uh, you, ha you, you, do, you do have to, to do minimum pieces, and so I had the first 25 pieces. I was nearly broke because I'm not a rich man. Um, and uh, then I was able to sell the first 25 pieces to friends, family, and fools. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and, uh, in that, and at that moment, I said, hmm, uh, why don't I try to really make it a company? No? And uh, I wrote uh, two emails uh, <laughs> uh, to, uh, to people uh, that I thought might be interested in helping me out. Uh, because they are rich and they know about uh, they know more about watches than me, and uh, I found one uh, uh, partner now who owns uh, a third of the company, uh, Peter Bravik, and uh, he said I love this project. He's also Austrian, but he was always moving around the world and is based in Switzerland, and uh, he he was really as passionate as me. He understood uh, the legacy. He understood this, the design language, uh, and uh, and so we started the company. And the rest is now, yeah, it's like uh, you are tumbling from one step to the next. But it was, uh, I mean, I am like uh, not only an artistic side, I'm also trained as a lawyer uh, formally. Um, there is, of course, a plan. There is, uh, uh, with, uh, it's, it's not just, uh, it's not a hobby or it's not like a, a crazy idea, I think. Uh, but what really tr uh, motivates me and drives me is the pleasure to see people like today, uh, people coming to our private uh, showroom here and to appreciate what we have done. You know? And uh, also what I really love is uh, since the beginning, when we launched, we receive from, I receive emails from around the world where people ask me for information about the historic clocks or pocket watches they have in their collection. And this also, for example, it was such a pleasure or, I was uh, three years ago when we were still dancing the Viennese waltzes here uh, at the big ballroom uh, festivities at the opera, at the music, uh, at the Golden Hall, at the music fan. Uh, a, um, a friend comes up uh, and says, uh, uh, actually a, a famous Austrian designer of, of today, and said, look, Robert, what I have. And he pulls out of his frack, of his uh, uh, suit, a golden uh, Suhi pocket watch. And he said, look what, what I have, Robert. It's uh, a pocket watch from my grand-grandfather, a Suhi. And you know, this uh, gives me goosebumps and that's yeah. why I'm doing this. Uh, it's not, yeah, it's, it's not, I'm, yeah, I'm, it's, it's not about, uh, my, also my whole life was about uh, this notion of meaning is more than money. I try, I, I try to, 
to, to live, uh, yeah, it's meaning is uh, more, uh, yeah. more important than money. But then again, uh, of course, we are a small company and we have to make money. So uh, sure. it, uh, it's, it's really wonderful that, uh, for example, from the beginning, uh, Laurent Picciotto from uh, Grand Passion and the other retailers uh, really trusted us. Even in the first year, you know, where many say, oh, who knows this Robert guy in one year, he's gone again. And, um, and that we really have, uh, have found from the beginning uh, collectors that were not friends and not fools and not uh, family. So, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. So, yeah. It's so exciting Sorry. to get the, that, the company over those first two or three years, get the, that first tranche of, uh, of uh, pieces sold and for people to start talking about it. I, I, I love it. Uh, I, I love the stain because it's so distinctive. Just you could not mistake it for anything else. It is uh, Carl Suki has that identity, and I always marvel about how difficult it is to create an identity in something that size that is unique. And considering there are so many others out there, so yeah. that it's so hard to make a signature that is recognisable across a room. And, that is uh, so. That is so interesting. I was the other day, Robert, I was uh, in London uh, at the Royal Academy for the Francis Bacon exhibition and I was thinking exactly that. The impact of, uh, of okay, somebody like Francis Bacon, just the imagery is impactful enough. Amazing. But then the surfaces that I use to express that message are completely different to what is given to us in watchmaking where, yeah, we can recall of a uh, people like Gerald Gente using a Mickey Mouse and shocking the whole world, you know, on a small dial. Uh, but today, yeah, the canvas in watchmaking is fairly, is fairly smaller, like John is saying. But there is the incredible fascination and charm of uh, uh, the technological part, uh, the micro-mechanics, that is the other way to express uh, art in, uh, in watchmaking. What are you most linked to now the aesthetics or the mechanics when you think watchmaking and when you express yourself in watchmaking well uh, honestly as uh, not not coming from watchmaking itself but uh, really appreciating uh, mark Yeni to be in our team and therese widmer for for the clocks uh, of course for me it's uh, it's easier uh, to identify you know with uh, the process of a designer, let's say. But uh, then again, uh, for me, uh, the, the most uh, challenging part is uh, you uh, really do, I'm basically the in-between. Uh, again, like a, like a courier, you know, it's uh, about, I have to make sure that this watch is really uh, showing the time and on time. And uh, so really uh, pushing uh, and, and supporting, in that case, Mark Yeni or Therese Widmer. And their main interest is uh, that this uh, watch works and uh, it works for 200 years in our cases. Um, and then on the other hand, I work with, young de with a young designer um, like uh, Milos Ristin or in that case, uh, Rainer Much. And they, you know, their, own, their, their focus is really on the aesthetics and pushing the limits of making it more beautiful and more beautiful. And then uh, how to integrate uh, these two different worlds into one. And that's uh, my role in that sense, I think. And that's uh, uh, also where I say, okay, uh, Milos, uh, we are not yet there. Uh, first round, okay, second round, we are not yet there. Okay, uh, Milos, uh, let's go. We visit uh, Vienna, the Art of Los Bar, having drinks there. We go to the Museum of Applied Arts, looking at Viennese modernism there. We eat a Wiener schnitzel and drink Viennese wine. And, you know, uh, pushing the limits until uh, this kind of, uh, there's a, a symbiosis uh, of the technical part and the aesthetic part. Uh, and for example, with this, uh, I think with the table clock, what we have achieved, usually you have the clock, the mechanic. And then most of uh, the makers just put a case on top and that's it. Uh, in our case, it was really the aim uh, to have it in an integrated uh, form and function. And uh, when you look at it, it's like a scenario of an opera house, you know, where the play uh, is done by the wheels, but then again, uh, it, it perfectly fits uh, uh, together. And uh, we are, we sense... are... oh, Sorry, Robert, you made me think, and uh, I'm sure Johnny will join me on this one. We are guilty of uh, talking about independence probably far too much 
uh, for what we do. But we think that uh, in independence, in independence, really stays a lot of uh, watchmaking as being a form of art. In your experience, and of course you are independent, how critical being independent was to go through this process that you are describing and to make what Karl Suhi is today and will become tomorrow? Can you repeat the question uh, again? How, how much is being independent important uh, in this process that you have, uh, you have explained and for what your brand will be in the future? Well, honestly, it's, it's, it's super important for me because uh, uh, I, I could, uh, I think I could not, uh, you know, f uh, in our case, we are a super small team. It's a complex team uh, with all people uh, around us. But then again, it's very uh, straight uh, and fast decisions. And it's not uh, market studies. It's not um, uh, processes, uh, structures and hierarchies. Uh, so in that sense, I think uh, I could not, uh, I mean, I admire the big brands, uh, and uh, it's 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 amazing what other big brands are, are doing. But um, it's it would not be my world. I think I was uh, many 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 years. I only made myself independent as an entrepreneur two years ago, just one month before Corona hit. Before I was employed, uh, basically as a diplomat and as a crew leader, etc. Uh, and um, I exited on purpose, uh, of course, because I say. Uh, okay, I don't want to deal with all the uh, bureaucracies, <laughs> etc., and internal politics. And I think uh, what, of course, the independents uh, can do, uh, depending on on the teams, they are they can take in a way more risk. Uh, but of course, the, the the issue is always to be a sustainable business, no? uh, and um, that's a tricky part because uh, when you look at the at the market, it's basically four big brands that are dominating uh, uh, the game. And then there are a couple of independents, yes, um, but there are very few that are really uh, building a, sustain a sustainable uh, business. Yeah, in terms right. of volumes, yes. In terms of uh, <laughs> values, it's amazing what's happening at the moment yes. because the, for the and that's the only way different. you have to be, basically what, what, what our brand is about, and I think all luxury brands are about, uh, apart from the legacy, of course, which is, uh, of course, uh, something very unique you cannot repeat, but is uh, the handcrafting excellence, for example, uh, with, uh, with Mark Yeni or, or Therese. It's uh, one important part that we have to, to focus on. The other part is uh, we always have to be more creative, fast and, and, and uh, innovative than the big ones. No? And uh, that's, uh, that's a challenge uh, because we have not that many resources. No? Uh, but then again, uh, we have very creative, independent minds. Uh, so that gives us uh, a, a niche opportunity uh, for sure. And, uh, and you can make decisions. You can make decisions any, every day, and which is exactly what's happening to us in our small, for the small yeah. role that we are, exactly. we are playing. And, and also uh, what I think today is an advantage also is that people now, uh, um, as, uh, as they learn about uh, the watchmaking uh, business uh, that, okay, when people talk about luxury uh, watches and then uh, there are 1 million pieces uh, built, uh, it's not about the exclusiveness anymore. So what we can also do is uh, stress this exclusiveness uh, that, uh, for example, this version of our table clock exists 10 pieces and that's it. Yeah. That's, uh, this is it. No? And uh, there's... Uh, there are collectors uh, that appreciate that and that really want to have the number one, the number seven uh, or the number 10. And uh, in that sense, this exclusiveness uh, also helps. But uh, it's, uh, it's a challenge and uh, uh, you have to balance this, uh, this uh, challenging way. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Johnny, Austrian watchmaking, we have talked about Russian watchmaking, Finnish watchmaking, British watchmaking, American recently. We have mentioned a few times Haybring, a watchmaker that we, we really respect and like. Um, uh, wh where is Austrian watchmaking going, you think, Johnny? And uh, maybe we could entertain that kind of uh, a discussion with, uh, with Robert in terms of where Karl Suchi wants to be recognized in that. <laughs> Well, Austria has been, for a country that is so close to, uh, to Switzerland, uh, it, it's nearly amazing that you know, for so long, Austria really hasn't had a significant presence 
uh, in at least in contemporary watchmaking. But uh, you know, Felix uh, Habring or Hebring has been uh, he's one of the, the long standing uh, innovators. He he created this wonderful uh, split second uh, chronograph. It was used by IWC. He uses his, his own double chronograph nowadays. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Hebring are really. In, in the same way, if you could uh, compare uh, what uh, Konstantin Chaikin has done for what in Russia, in Russia mm -hmm. uh, Hebring, the very fact that Hebring are there, and it can't be an easy thing to do, is to try and establish uh, a brand, a name, and a reputation in a country that is traditionally buying its watches from Switzerland or from possibly Germany. And uh, so I know how hard it is, uh, even in Ireland here, for uh, watchmakers to establish uh, credibility, if you like. Because people seem to think, you know, he's Irish. If he was any good, he'd be Swiss. Do you know? And, uh, <laughs> so, and there's that sort of uh, credibility issue. But I think uh, what Felix and Maria uh, Hebring have done uh, with their little company and how personalized their company is too because it's very much you don't just get Felix you get Maria as well and, yes. uh, you know uh, it, it's uh, I, I think it's fantastic what yeah. they've done and again that gives them part of their identity that they're very much so do you, do you husband see, and wife team do you see uh, Carl Suhi tagging along and uh, maybe we can ask Robert as well do you do you do you care about yes. Austrian watchmaking or your project goes beyond uh, or this has only just a, a small importance in comparison to your general mission. You know, I, I cannot really look uh, so much into the future, but uh, I think, uh, of course, uh, when you um, think about uh, what you mentioned, uh, British or German uh, watchmaking, I think Austria has an amazing legacy. There were like uh, more than a thousand watchmasters uh, in the Habsburg monarchy. Uh, there was uh, the emperor who was like attracting uh, French and Swiss watchmasters uh, to act exactly in my district where we have our showroom, was building own houses where the families were housed uh, in the first floor and ground level, they had the workshops. So there is an amazing uh, legacy there. But of course, uh, uh, now we still have this uh, school that uh, Emperor Franz Joseph founded in Karlstein, where uh, every year there are still uh, wonderful young uh, watchmasters uh, coming out from this school. I don't see yet, uh, I think, the the possibility to to reboost um, and 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 compete at that uh, I, I don't think uh, hopefully our contribution um, and I think what we get also from these young students uh, that yeah, it we, could inspire it could inspire exactly, some yeah, of for them. example uh, two years ago or three years ago at the last uh, Basel World we invited the best uh, graduate from that school to accompany us. Uh, to uh, to Basel to invite him uh, to show him uh, and uh, motivate uh, you know to uh, to really uh, uh, be uh, in that in that business and not just go to micro mechanics you no know, which is a big business still in Austria and uh, yep. I think what we also aimed of course with uh, the the table clock is uh, stressing the Austrian handcrafting legacy and uh, there for example for for the the case. There are only two people, two, uh, two companies in the world that can do that today. Uh, or for the glass with this hand, uh, hand cutting, uh, with the hand gravure, there are only may, may very few companies that can do that. And I think uh, in this kind of digital times, there's a chance, of course, to, to push um, this kind of handcrafting legacy. But uh, indeed, you, you need to give opportunity, you know, uh, and you... Uh, and, and young people have to see a future in, in that uh, sense. And um, that's uh, really tricky. And uh, on the one hand, on the, on the other hand, um, what we don't have yet uh, is like a cluster in Switzerland where you can source all the parts, you know, uh, really yeah. uh, made. This is... Uh, yeah, the, the ecosystem, as we call it. The ecosystem is not uh, yet uh, there anymore. And, yeah. uh, but still, uh, for example... <laughs> I have to give another, uh, uh, Austrian can be very obsessive and ing uh, ingenious. We are in touch with um, some scientists here that are building the most precise um, timekeeping machine in the world. Why? Because you need it uh, for, for example, driverless, uh, driverless um, 
uh, cars. Car, uh, yeah. GPS, GPS, for example, is based on, uh, on measuring time. But uh, today, the measurement is so unprecise yet. I mean, it's super precise, but not precise enough to avoid accidents. So there's, uh, there are people here that are uh, researching this kind of super, super, super precise uh, clock. And for example, that's again, a dream would be, okay, can we do that on a wristwatch? You know? <laughs> uh, and um, there are always, uh, there's always room for innovation, I think. Uh, and perhaps it's not like the traditional way, um, the Swiss way now, uh, but uh, finding uh, again a different take, you know, uh, it, a... won't, it won't be the, the smartwatch either because that's long gone with Apple and, and yeah. others. So we'll see. But what's for sure is that uh, handcrafting and as like a, a piece of, uh, of jewelry, a piece of status uh, on your wrist that will um, always uh, stay, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Abs and it is very real, which is the problem. I have when crossing the new technologies with the art of watchmaking because they come, they don't work together. You know, when you talk about NFTs, for example, now and blockchain relates to the world of watchmaking, I can't think of anything going more the other side to the reason why people love watches in the end. They love it because they are very real things. They, they, they are not speculative items. Uh, per definition, but then things obviously have different facets. And my question is, Robert and Johnny as well, I, you love, I think you love this. Johnny and I, you know, a couple of years after the UNESCO, uh, of course, um, I recognized the art of watchmaking as a, you know, a patrimony of uh, humanity. Uh, Johnny and I have always been big advocates that if watchmaking is not a form of art, you know, somebody has to explain, explain us what art is in general. Mm -hmm. But today we have an expert, of course, from the world of art. Uh, how do you see watchmaking? Uh, do, you, do you feel watchmaking as a form of art? And, uh, and where, where is it going to go? Because at the moment it's one of the few things that people are so, so, so intensely and passionately and intimately um, uh, attached to uh, for what we see. Well, uh, on the one hand, yes, it, uh, it's, uh, it's a work of art. And uh, I also, for example, uh, see uh, our, our pieces as works of art. But on the other hand, as a, as a, as a contemporary art curator, uh, there's a big difference at the end. You know, this, is, this is still a function, even so we don't read the time anymore from the clock or the watch. But uh, what uh, art, of course, uh, is all about is uh, there is uh, no functional uh, limit there. And in that sense, uh, it's uh, more, it's, it's even more radical uh, than uh, the most radical watchmaster, let's say, and the most crazy watch you can, uh, can build. It's still about uh, time and keeping uh, time, whereas art, it's a complete, you do what you want, no, in a way. Uh, and uh, uh, that's, uh, for me, uh, a big difference and that will always exist. Although there are watches that there are watches that don't give the time. <laughs> okay, well then you are entering uh, sculpture, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, sculpture for the wrist. And uh, of course, I mean there are amazing uh, artistic uh, jewelry uh, timepieces, uh, etc. That, that that are amazing, uh, and I love them. And uh, they are really also about savoir faire, you not know, that you really know how to do it. Uh, whereas uh, in art, that it really hits my stomach. Uh, and it really moves me. Uh, there's only very little, few uh, moments uh, when I look around in museums, etc. Uh, and in that sense, it, the same is uh, true for watches. No, I still haven't found, apart from my own watches, I have to admit, those that really move me and I really long to um, to have. Well, there are there are some, but uh, we have we have a few to suggest. And uh, I know, uh, I know, <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> but I have to I have to first sell my Suki watches before I'm uh, buying other <laughs> watches. Yeah, Johnny, Johnny, is so interesting, isn't it? Uh, um, when you yeah, cross over story, from one yeah. world to another. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you, you can see how the two are, are interlinked. I happen to think that, you know, some of the finishing, some of the engraving, some of the, the surface uh, decorations and that, and that's where I see art. Uh, the, so possibly in the direction of maybe Vianney Hotter and coming up with uh, something that's crazy that nobody has ever thought of before. For sure. And where it's functionality. Yes, it's functional, but it's not necessary. 
Well, we're definitely yeah. right. I know for yeah. sure. Also, so, uh, Joe, there are easier ways of doing it than yeah. uh, a lot of uh, the, the watchmakers. So they make these little novelties, these little innovations, which I think are they're quirky. They're often superfluous to the mm -hmm. actual requirements of mm -hmm. the wearer who needs to see hours, minutes, maybe seconds, and maybe date to have all these little other uh, amuse bush that, uh, and, and I think that that's where. I would stand by that, and I would say that I, I do think that there 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 is a, a there are artists in watchmaking who are creating these different uh, techniques and um, for sure, and they really have an independent artistic mind for sure, and they are super obsessive, and I really admire uh, these people um, that really push the limits uh, and not just doing again and, and again uh, the same uh, the same thing, yeah, and taking the risk also the artistic risk. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, uh, the uh, the day uh, the day and night. Uh, I thought which, I saw it. Yeah. The day and night, uh, beautiful piece. Yeah. Uh, this was again, you know, uh, an artistic mind. Uh, this was uh, very much Laurent Picciotto uh, that uh, asked me, "Hey, why don't we do that?" No, and he's an artistic mind. He's uh, he plays the guitar. Uh, I remember, Robert, you came to me on the back of that. And of course, I, I know Laurent and I respect Laurent. Uh, you know, I've been respecting him for ages. And uh, um, you, you asked me, shall I really do that? I remember when we had that conversation as well. I yeah. want to be Laurent when I grow up. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, he, uh, he's a great supporter, really. And uh, he's, he's a, he has an, an amazing, um, I think, uh, he knows what uh, what can work. I think uh, he uh, amazing yes, sense of vision. Yeah, vision. Uh, amazing yeah. sense of uh, vision. Yeah, and uh, and for example, in, in in that case, okay, that that's the beauty of an independent brand. Okay, uh, do you know how we decided it? It was through Instagram. He he posts. He sends me a post that we did, where we just asked our audience, "Do you like more white or black?" And did like a. a a survey and yeah. then uh, posted it. And then a couple of days later, uh, Laurent sends me an, an Instagram message, Robert, why don't we do that, exactly that? <laughs> how, how it was, how it was uh, like built, uh, graphic design. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, mounted, render. Uh, on the internet. And I said, okay, I talked to Mark uh, uh, and the next day we said, okay, we can do it. Okay, how many, well, what kind of edition? Okay, those many pieces. And uh, it's, uh, two months later, we, we, we got it uh, shipped to, to Paris and uh, now to, uh, to, London, uh, to, to London, to you. And, um, and uh, not even my dear team colleague, Salomea, uh, was aware that we just uh, quickly decided and did it. You know? And that's uh, also the beauty to work, for example, with people like uh, Magieni. Uh, who I think is also happy, not another Swiss Swiss brand, but uh, working with a crazy Austrian here, you know, <laughs> ask him to, to do this kind of a piece, no? Yeah. That's great. That's a great story and we like that. And, Brilliant, um, yeah, yeah. And I can't believe uh, nearly an hour has already gone in our conversation. Really? I have wow. to thank you both for your time. Yeah, but don't worry, uh, Robert, this is the beginning. We will, we will, do, we will do more for sure. Yeah, super. And, uh, are you going to be around at Watches and Wonders in... Uh, in yes, uh, yes, I'm going to see you there. Mm -hmm. Will we sure. see Belvedere at Watches and Wonders? Um, I, I don't know my agenda yet, uh, but I'm sure we'll be there. And the Belvedere, are we expecting to see that? No, no, uh, it's, I can tell you on Friday. I have a meeting on Thursday uh, with Mark Jenny and uh, the rest of the gang. And uh, I think, um, hopefully, uh, it's ready. But... It should be ready the latest in June because then we have our 200 year celebration at the Belvedere Palace and hopefully you can join us for that party. Well, that would be amazing. Hey, I don't know if I have uh, a suit that is smart enough for that. But I'll, for sure. <laughs> uh, for sure. I'll sort something out. You're an Italian. You're an Italian. La bella figura. I don't worry about you at all. You know? <laughs> I definitely don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, perfect. So... 
Yes, what to say? This was really interesting, and I hope you enjoyed uh, this our very spontaneous chat, Robert. Johnny, thank you, Beto. Thank you, Johnny. Yeah, it was great, uh, and uh, we keep uh, we keep on pushing you know, the independence here. Fantastic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. With with ca with ca with being careful as well, because I think we overdid it a little bit <laughs> recently. But uh, we'll see how it goes, Johnny. Yeah? Well, Super. let's try and do something with uh, Karsuki and see if we can't, uh, absolutely, you know, uh, raise that profile a little more and uh, look forward to. As you say, you're celebrating 200 years uh, this year. It would be a good year to. Uh, to Absolutely. Make, sure, make pe sure people know about it. So we will definitely come back to this, Pietro. Thank you so much, really. Best wishes from Vienna. Brilliant. Thank you. That was our live with Robert Pankenhoff from Karl Suchi in Vienna. And you will no doubt uh, learn more from us. And thank you, Johnny, for being with us again as a proper imposter every Tuesday Loved night. It. Loved it. It was yeah. a pleasure. So this recording will be available on your Instagram feed, uh, IGTV, for the next days, and then it will go on YouTube as well. So if you want to learn more about Karl Suchi, Robert Pankinov, for a very interesting uh, character himself with his uh, uh, art background as well, um, just don't, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Thank you so much, guys, and I'll see you uh, in the real world very, very soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.